But as it stands today, you are not going to invest if given the opportunity. Like no way. I will if I know you are in a legal job. I will I will I will pursue. I try to maybe I'm, I will be kind and pursue it. Go back to your lawyer. Oh my god. Hit it, boys. I got grilled. Welcome back to episode two of our very first show, Leap, the show documenting the process of building my startup, not in the cards media, in real time. And I'm your host, Hassan Rasmi. In the last episode of Leap, which you can watch through the description below, you saw my carefully thought out plans become completely obsolete as I got terminated from my job and COVID put a pause on the entire world. Now, today's episode is about what happens after this point. It's about coming up with and validating your business idea. Specifically, it's about how I can came up with and validated the idea for Not In The Cards Media, even though I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And as you'll see at the end, my pitch did not go well, but we'll get there. First, I want to talk about getting to the idea itself. Most of the stories that you read about or watch online, they have a very similar storyline. Founders came up with a perfect idea at the perfect time, and then they started working on it. But let me tell you right now that that is not at all how it went down with me. And there's obviously good reason for that. I wasn't exactly clear-headed after going through such a tough experience. Apparently, I was actually going through something called the Kubler-Ross model or the grief theory. Let me explain. When we lose someone or something, we humans typically go through a very common cycle. And scientists have coined that cycle, the Kubler-Ross model or the grief theory after the Swiss American psychiatrist who came up with this model. I'm actually about to play you some really gripping clips of me going through these cycles. So in an effort to keep your attention, I'm going to play this very cute clip of puppies running around while I explain this very important point in a second. In 1969, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross created the five stages of grief after spending many years working with terminally ill people. Eventually, these stages have become commonly accepted for other experiences too, like loss. For the most part, these stages are pretty well defined in the scientific community. They start with denial or isolation, go on to anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally acceptance. Now, as you'll see in a second, I was clearly going through all of these five stages and I have clips to show you. I just did not really know at the time that that's what I was going through. For example, take a look at this clip. That was right after I had gotten laid off and I was sitting there, I really didn't know what to do. And I thought that going on a walk was going to clear my head. Now, as you watch this clip though, focus on what's coming out of my mouth and how I actually look. Tell me if I look convincing. <laughs> Oh man, I'm f***ing pumped for this. It's gonna be a wild f***ing ride, but I can do it. I'm gonna do it. It's gonna be f***ing great. Yeah, not, not very convincing at all. I, I look like someone just kidnapped my dog, even though I'm saying that I'm so excited. I was not excited. I was just in denial. And that's the first stage. The second stage is all about rage and anger. And although the next clip I'm going to play you doesn't really show you how angry I was, you can trust me on the fact that I was pretty angry. Oh. Where the f do I start with this f mess? Where the f do I start? In the third stage, you start asking questions like what if and if only and you start thinking about what could have happened. Like for me, it was very real. I kept saying like if only I hadn't traveled for my uncle's funeral, if only I had booked the right exam venue, all of these questions I kept asking myself saying if only, if only that's the bargaining stage. That's the third stage. Now for the fourth stage, the pain and depression stage, I'm actually quite reluctant to play the next clip. And that's because I'm all about positivity and I'm always smiling and so much energy. I really care about that kind of stuff. But this clip is actually quite sad. <laughs> I was in a lot of pain and and it's weird for me to play this clip but for the sake of transparency here is that clip anyway not everyone forget how horrible this fucking feels and i hope i never forget it i hope i never forget how this feels Game on, baby. Yeah, 
the good news ladies and gentlemen is that it's not all doom and gloom the final stage stage number five acceptance that's where you start to see the light at the end of the tunnel that's when you start to think clearly and you start moving forward with your life so slowly surely things started to become a lot more clear which brings me to the point that i was asking where the heck do i go from here as you can imagine there was literally no chance at all that i could have figured out my next steps while i was going through these cycles i was nowhere near the right head space going through these stages takes time and that's precisely what my brain needed to process everything but once it did boy oh boy fireworks baby i came up with so many options and i started iterating my idea first thing i did was try to figure out a way to make money which is kind of important so i launched my own side hustle and i started my own law firm working with startups technology and media companies which is the only thing that i enjoy doing anyway in the legal field and i'm uh, plugging www.dressmelaw.com tell your friends tell your family afterwards i started brainstorming ideas i started thinking through problems and trying to come up with solutions, problems that I was having. But no matter what I was doing, every single step of the way, I had the camera in my hand. I was filming everything that was going on. So that takes me back to the same issue from the very beginning. Wanna make videos, wanna make lots of videos, no clue what kind of business that could be. But that's exactly where Nitsi started to become clear. I kept looking at the camera and I kept being like, I have to do something with this. Which takes me to the second part of this episode. Assuming you gave yourself some time, how do you come up with and validate a good business idea? Can you just sit down and literally start thinking through an idea, like thinking problem, solution, and oh, ta-da, I can now work on this idea? The answer is a resounding yes. But if you were to just listen to most people, you would think that that's not really how it all works. And I'm definitely not the only one who started the business exactly that way. You might have heard of a very small $2 billion company called Yelp. Yep, they started exactly like that. What about that other $15 billion company called Twitch? They started like that too. And so many other companies started exactly in the same way, just thinking through a problem. And that's what I started to do. Okay, so we know I wanna make videos, but we have no idea what type of videos. Should I make entertainment videos, educational videos, documentary videos, legal videos? Wait, can I travel in the middle of the pandemic? No. Food videos, music videos, health videos? Oh my God. Look at me, there's no way. So many different types of videos and I couldn't figure out which one. And on top of all of that, my research indicated that you really needed to focus on a niche. You needed to pick one category and get really good at that category. And that's how many successful YouTubers and other creators became very famous. And even if creators want to branch out and do other types of videos, which I realized that the data indicates they actually do. It's incredibly hard for them to do that. And I get that because they've built a loyal audience that came to expect a very particular type of content. So if they had it to branch out and do something new, they would have to start almost from scratch. And that's a tough compromise. So what the heck do I do now? How can Disney and Marvel have such a loyal audience that no matter what they were releasing, they were going to come back and watch their new movies and their new shows because they trusted their brand? Why couldn't creators do that? I can't believe there's not a single household name that I know of that makes diverse programming on social media, not one. And the more I research, the more I realize that the data indicates that this makes absolutely no sense. It's like we're entering a second golden age of video. It's like this is World War II and the film industry is exploding, except that that huge industry is now online independent creators and social media is our distribution powerhouse. I started obsessing over this. You see where this is going? Now, what if there was a company that could become a household name in the social media sphere, just like Gimlet, but with videos, where its audience would not come back because of a specific type of show, but because of the general quality and reliability of the content that they produce. That would literally create a ripple effect. And with every single new release, you would have viewers ready to watch and explore the new content. And by default, you would have advertisers also lined up. And given that I wanted to create many different types of videos and the data was irresistible, and the stars were aligning. Before I knew it, I realized that I was actually building a media company. And from there, Nitsi Media, the social media production company, was born. Now that I knew kind of what I wanted to do, I had to validate this idea. And the best way to validate any idea is to ask people to pay you for it. If they part with their cash and they give you money, that's probably a good indication that there is demand for whatever it is that you're trying to do. That's what people call product market fit. So the moment you've all been waiting for, that's what I did. I went and asked someone that I knew very well for money for the company. Well, kind of. I pitched him the idea. 
Now, the guy you saw in the beginning of this episode, the guy who was telling me to go back to law, he is actually a two-time founder of multi-million dollar companies. And his current company, Space Chain, and I'm not even kidding, is literally flying satellites into space with SpaceX and the European Space Agency. Okay, he's casually asked me to mention that Space Chain has satellite payload that is currently operating in the International Space Station. Now, I have absolutely no idea what it means, but here's a video of an astronaut installing it for them in the ISS anyway. In other words, this guy has been around the block. And since he also happens to be my roommate for two years in college and one of my best friends, he is definitely someone that I trust. Here's what I asked him to do though. I gave him a two minute pitch and I asked him to rate me from zero to 10 and to tell me whether he would give it the opportunity invest in Nitsi as it currently stands. Here's what happened. Okay. Ready? Yeah, you, you're ready. Okay. The television industry is being completely replaced by social media companies like YouTube and Facebook. And every other founder that you look at in OTT markets, they are trying to build the next Netflix or Quibi or a subscription based model. But what people are not noticing is the opportunity as it exists today in social media. Social media alone captures almost 70% of all of the ad revenue that goes online. And video is the fastest growing medium that exists today. At the same time, we know that the television industry is a huge $180 billion industry. So the social media industry is still a tiny, tiny fraction of that. So what we're trying to do at Not In The Cards Media is capture the market that is going to be growing exponentially in the video sphere as it trans as it transforms from television to social media. Actually, YouTube today is becoming the number one career aspiration for Gen Y and Gen Z. And on top of that, Facebook has integrated a series button where people can start to create production like companies around them where they can create different types of series and start to monetize their brands online. And that's exactly the market that we're trying to capture today. I'm done. Down? That's terrible. Yeah. That's like a that's like a one point eight out of ten. <laughs> one point eight. Okay, let me try again. What does your company do? That's a thorough pitch because at the end of it, I don't know what what is your company. It's like what does your company do? I'm talking okay. about nothing. Because it's just a layer of facts piled together. Okay. And it's just again, it's layer of facts and facts and facts. At the end, end of it, it's like facts. So when you say you're all, it's done, I'm so like surprised. What's new? Well, you didn't share anything almost, I think you didn't share anything new, which basically among the hundred startup I'm gonna talk to today, I'm not gonna remember anything. Yeah, so that did not go too well at all. But that was my first try and I was so nervous. I forgot literally everything I wanted to say. But regardless, I don't give up. So I started practicing and recording myself for hours and doing it over and over and over. And I worked on my pitch for dozens of hours and I sent him a new pitch. And thankfully, he had something a lot better to say. He gave me a 7.2. So going from a two to 7.2, I'll take it. It's a huge improvement and it means I'm getting closer to a good pitch. Every single day gets me closer to the day when I can actually raise my seed round. And the moral of the story here is this. When it comes to finding a business idea, every single story is so different. Perfect stories that you hear online are not exactly fully true. So don't be so hard on yourself because trust me when I tell you that starting a company, it can be a very lonely process. And statistically, you have a huge chance of failure. So for you and me to be best positioned to succeed, we have to really go with our own flow and just be a little bit kinder to ourselves. If you need time, take it because this is a marathon and you will need all of your energy. But once you commit to doing this, you're going all in, full force, full steam ahead and keep getting better. Nothing is stopping you. That's the mindset. And with enough practice and friends to help, you can be pitch ready. And in a future episode, we'll see how ready I really am when I'm applying to Y Combinator and when I'm trying to pitch this idea to investors. Thank you so much for watching today's episode and I'll see you on episode three of our very first show, Leap. My name is Hassan Rasmi and I hope to see you next time. One more thing, guys, please consider liking, subscribing and sharing this with other people. It helps a lot. And if you got any value out of this episode or even if it was a little bit entertaining, please consider sharing it and following us on all social media at Watch Nitsi. And I really appreciate your help. And if you don't subscribe, my company dies. So subscribe. <laughs> <laughs>